welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we're talking about some spoilers about everything. I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And let's start asking, what's new to you, Alex? Okay, so a couple (laughs) episodes ago, we talked about uh, queer representation in comics, and we talked about Archie, and we talked about Jughead being asexual, and we talked about the show Riverdale. I (laughs) just binge-watched the first season of Riverdale, which is now on Netflix. I've been meaning to to get on that. So what what did you think? So good. (laughs) Well, good. Like, so the first ep. Okay, so basically what I would recommend is watch the first episode and then go listen to the podcast Cry Me a Riverdale. (laughs) It's a brand new podcast that they just started making because it came on Netflix, but it's got... um, uh, Mikey Newman, and then one of the guys from Rooster Teeth. Um, oh. Uh, John Reisinger. Okay. And they, they just talk about the show, and both of them are great. Mikey does uh, a YouTube series called Movies with Mikey, which is probably my favorite YouTube series right now. And he just, like, breaks down both popular movies and, like, movies with a bad rap, and he sort of, like, gives it an alternate view of them. And I am just so obsessed with those videos because they just make me happy about movies. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like exactly my kind of deal. Like, I'm always watching those kinds of videos. I should, I will definitely give you, like, every link to every single episode because. (laughs) Okay. uh, Yeah, anyway. um, But they, the show is just so great. All of the, the teenagers are, like, fully fleshed out. They're not just, you know, one note. I mean, a couple of them are close to one note. Unfortunately, Kevin, mm-hmm. the, gay, the gay character, he's a little one note. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a feeling that as the show goes on, they'll probably explore him a little bit more. Fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Um, Jughead steals the show, absolutely. That's what I've heard. Even uh, even though they not they don't just ignore the fact that he was asexual in the comic, but they sort of go back on it. I will sort of quote Mikey Newman who does that podcast and that that YouTube series on Twitter people were asking about him about it because he likes Riverdale and he's um he's asexual and he's like I didn't come out till I was 33 give him some time (laughs) fair enough and yeah exactly I'm like well you can't argue with that (laughs) but anyway yeah I, I highly recommend the show it's adorable it's a great mystery they, they seriously, you have no idea who did any of it until, like, the second to the last episode. Well, that sounds, yeah, my, uh, my co-worker um, at my new job has been asking me if I've watched it because he recently watched the whole thing and he's really into it and nobody else oh, yeah. has one that he knows I, has oh. watched it. And he's like, I watch it so that I can talk to you about it. <laughs> well, tell him to listen to that podcast and then he'll have somebody to at least listen to about it. I will. I'll, I'll mention it for sure. Yeah, it's pretty funny because, yeah, he brought it up like just after, you know, we had talked about it. And I was like, that's funny that you ask because <laughs> I haven't watched it, but I uh, talked about it recently. So I guess I really should. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so what have you been up to? Oh, boy. Um, well, just li- late last night, I got back home from Great Wolf Lodge. Woo-woo. It's so fun. So I don't know if anyone listening uh, might not know what this place is. It's a, sort of a resort for, like, families and kids. It's like a big water park hotel with, like, other kinds of fun stuff to do. And it was awesome. It was my niece's ninth birthday. And so uh, my dad, like, took us all there. And actually, it's really funny because um, after work on uh, Friday... Uh, Dylan, my younger brother, and I were driving up north to Centralia to Great Wolf Lodge together, and, like, we're halfway there, and I get a call from my dad saying, hey, so Great Wolf Lodge overbooked. We don't have rooms. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) But it ended up working out pretty well. It was kind of irritating. So they were like, don't worry, we will refund your entire 
a trip purchase. You can still play in the water park, do all the stuff. We'll give you some freebies. Um, we're going to set you up for free at the uh, Lucky Eagle Casino, which was about a 15-minute drive away. Uh, and you can come back and get a room for free next time you want to visit. So, like, wow. it, they did their best to sort of... So I think that what it was was they had some maintenance issues. Like, there were several floors oh. that were, like, closed off for maintenance. Um, so I think oh, probably... Oh, they probably didn't tell the system when they were... Yeah. Yeah, or it just happened since we booked or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe some mildew or mold or something that, they, that got called to their attention, and so they weren't able to use the rooms that they had booked. And so... Uh, but they made they made good and they you know and it was just a really really fun time. Uh, there's this super rad thing they do there called Magic Quest. Um, it's for kids, but it's still <laughs> super fun and it's a way for them to just really get your money. You can in their gift shop you can buy these cool magic wands um, that are used for this Magic Quest thing, which is basically like a treasure hunt around the hotel. Like you get this little guide book that has hints about like this stuff you gotta find and like you use your wand and like point it at stuff and it's like hooray you got this thing now go here and point it at that thing and then like once you find all the stuff you get these runes and apparently like (laughs) to finish the whole quest it takes like four hours of playtime that's kind of awesome though yeah but the cool thing is you've got your wand so you know you do a couple of quests and then you go home and then next time you come back you can pick up where you left off oh that's yeah. smart. Yeah, I know. So the kids will really, really want to go back because they didn't finish <laughs> Magic Quest. <laughs> but it was super duper fun uh, playing in the water park. I definitely got some chlorine burns on my skin, though. That place is seriously chlorinated. Oh, my God. Just like you walk into the pool area and you're like... <laughs> but but it was really, really, really fun. Um <laughs> uh, last night before we left, um, in the pool area, there's this concession stand that has this treat called the tipping bucket. Um, what? It is a huge, it's like a bucket, like a small bucket. It's probably about six inches in diameter and about like eight inches deep. And it's full of, like, ice cream and cookies and brownies and candy and whipped cream. And it's just insane. So we, we got one of these. It cost $15. Uh, oh but we got goodness. one and shared it between I mean, all yeah, of us. If you, sh- if you share it, $15 isn't that bad. No, it's not. And, it you know, it's just a fun, crazy treat to get. You know, it was my niece's birthday. and Yeah, might as well. Yeah. <laughs> we, we saw that and we were like, well, we got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, no, it was really, really fun. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to be able to stay at a room actually in Great Wolf Lodge because the rooms are kind of neat and fun. And it yeah. would have been handy to, like, have a hotel room to go back to because we played all day on Saturday. Oh, Just yeah. I imagine all being day. really tired and then having to drive would be kind of annoying. Well, it was mostly just, like, because... Um, we were kind of sticking around because um, Will, my boyfriend, he wasn't able to join us until later in the day. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like it would have been nice to like take a break in the middle of the day and like go up to a room and like chill. But we just had to stay oh, and get out he got in like there. the yeah. chaos <laughs> of the lodge uh, while we're just like, oh, I just really need to like be somewhere else for a minute, please. Right. <laughs> But it was such a blast, and my niece had a super awesome birthday. She was like, this is my favorite thing. I want to do this every year for my birthday. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a really good time. But that's uh, I've been up to that and uh, sewing a costume for Ren Fair, which we're doing uh, next weekend for my birthday. <laughs> I'm actually, I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to finish it, but I'm getting really close and I've still got this week to get it done. So I think I'm going to be able to do it, but it's getting, it's getting a little scary. (laughs) What kind of costume are you doing? I'm just making a, an anachronistic, like little cute peasant costume thing. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I just, I had some, uh some patterns already and so I just went and picked up some fabric it's just like a little shift dress with like a bodice and a skirt okay yeah something yeah. that's like weather appropriate and... yeah because it's yeah it's gonna be hot um so I just wanted something cute and fun to wear yeah it's gonna be cute 
I, I think I, I, it's going to be exciting. I'll post pictures of it. You can see it when I'm done. You mentioned, <laughs> uh, you mentioned Centralia uh, and having to pass through Centralia to get up to Great Little Falls. It's actually in Centralia. It really is. I, I always feel like it's farther than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's either just north or just south of Centralia. There's another little town. Um, oh, what is it? It's like with all those auto dealerships. I'm really not sure. These days, oh I'm just not God. as I, I, familiar I with... I like a million times on the way to school and ho- and back through home. Well, anyway, I, I'm sure I did too. I just don't, <laughs> I don't recall anyway, what it is. There, there's, a little, there's a little store off the freeway. You can see it from the freeway. It's called Mattress Ranch. Ah, yes, with the cows. We drove past with it. Yeah, the that's cow- That that's is south. my favorite landmark on I-5. Yeah. It's like these cow statues outside that are all painted up crazy colors. And and the building's like sort of barn-esque looking. Yeah, that's rural Washington for you. Anyway, <laughs> go to their website and you'll get a good eyeful. Really? <laughs> yeah, well, they I mean, they have like pictures of, this, of, the, of the location. So for any listeners that want to know what we're talking about, just Google <laughs> Mattress Ranch and you will not yeah. be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah, that's just south of uh, Centralia because I passed it. It was a landmark because going north, it's like okay, we're finally out on the road, and then going south, it's like we're kind of almost home. Yeah, it's a good landmark that you're getting near. Yeah, Southern Washington. <laughs> yeah, I, I I definitely noticed that on my way up. It's pretty hard <laughs> not to notice. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially because it's just facing the the northbound freeway, like just right, right there. <laughs> it's pretty cute. And it's just, and they, yeah, it's so cute. They've got like little wooden cutouts of other farm animals and stuff too, but the cows are really a sight to see. Yeah, it's magical. <laughs> That's yeah. like something I honestly need to write a story about. Just like some weird Pacific Northwest Gothic story about I love Ranch. Pacific Northwest Gothic. That's like my favorite idea right now. Uh right. I Yeah, and there's one spot it's um I think it's a little further south than <laughs> than the cows is uh the the Beasley's diner that just has the big eat <laughs> sign. <laughs> eat Beasley's. Yep. Yeah, that that one w- always I gave me a chuckle, and it's just got a big mound of gravel, like a big mountain of gravel out back, because it's rural Washington, and there's just big mountains of gravel around. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know what it's called, but there's also, like, that weird, like, truck graveyard. Uh, yeah, that's really near there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all that sort of... And then also those, like, s- smaller versions of the famous statues around the world. Yeah, man. There's some weird stuff. The I five corridor is really weird. <laughs> it's just a weird, weird place. <laughs> yep. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I love Pacific Northwest Gothic. I'm super duper into that whole aesthetic right now. Well, isn't that Twin Peaks, basically? Right? Oh yeah, for real. Yeah. yeah it's... I, I haven't watched it at all because I didn't. I still haven't gotten into the the original series, but. Yeah, I haven't watched any of the new series. It. And I haven't watched the old series since I was, like, a child, which retrospectively didn't seem like it was a really good idea for me to watch it as a kid. Right. But this will this will give you a, a frame of reference. Uh, I remember going to the video store with my mom and renting the tapes of Twin Peaks. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose we've stalled long enough. We should probably get into our topic today. <laughs> uh, maybe. Although I do have a one quick story from work today that I really oh, wanted to share. We'll go right ahead then. Okay. By all means. So, um, I had to hold the operator's phone because the operator had to go on break. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I got hold of the phone, there was a call, and it was a prank call. And he. The, the the caller was like, hi, I was just wondering if you guys have any 70s vintage porn. <laughs> and I had no time to react. Like, I couldn't think of a great comeback. <laughs> um, so what I usually do in prank call situations is I just go into full, like, perfect customer service mode. <laughs> So I'll just be like, oh, uh, let me go check, you know, or something <laughs> silly like that. 
<laughs> um, but what I did was like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't carry that. Uh, thank you for calling. And then I hung up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that I w- was that def- definitely, you know, that was my day. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I wonder how much of a thrill that guy got out of that. It was at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what are you, you don't have anything better really? to do, dude. <laughs> I mean, it's a Sunday, but still, like, go to church. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I, y'all need most, Jesus. <laughs> in, in most other circumstances, I would not recommend church. But if you're calling a giant sto- store chain at 11 o'clock in the morning, having to go push multiple buttons on your phone in order to get to the operator or, like, oh. wait through all of the store hours and all that, and then... <laughs> just say something stupid like ugh. yeah go find some other better use for your time like I, at least you probably just like denied him that thrill because you'd like didn't right. get flustered you didn't yeah, exactly like, i didn't get flustered get and i didn't like laugh or whatever you're just like nope sorry bye <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta be pretty disappointing but i always worry it. they'll like keep calling back but that it literally it's so much effort to like listen to the lady talking and then give you the pro like <laughs> yeah it's just uh, not worth it thankfully thankfully you can't just press a button and get to us really quickly otherwise i feel like we'd get a lot more prank calls yeah probably so <laughs> okay now we can get started <laughs> now we can okay we'll get started <laughs> so today um we were gonna talk about historical fiction uh the third season of one of my favorite shows pull dark uh is gonna be premiering this month, I think it's uh, going to be airing on June 11th, which is going to be the day before this episode goes up. So good timing. Um, but also, there's just a lot of sort of historical fiction, historical fantasy that's very, very popular right now. Uh, that King Arthur Legend of the Sword is in theaters right now. Um, you know, ever since the Tudors, there's been a good handful of historical drama, you know, period television series on. Yeah, my mom is are... obsessed with Outlander, which is sort of similar. Yes, that's definitely, that's, it, it, it walks the line between historical fiction and historical fantasy because it's like a time traveler thing, but ultimately exactly, it's mostly yeah. just historical yeah, there's, fiction. Yeah, there's not like a lot of magic or anything going on in it. Yeah, it's just, there's the time travel and then let's just be in the time. Uh, yep. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, there's there's just a lot to talk about, and mostly what I was sort of interested in talking about is what people want out of historical fiction, the kinds of things that they expect to see, the kinds of things that exist in historical fiction because of audience expectation, um, and sort of how that relates to historical fact. Yeah. I would say almost omnipresent in any historical fiction that I've seen or I know about is definitely romance. Oh, yeah. I mean, historical romance is a huge, huge genre. I mean, there's, like, that's pretty much every, like, you know, pulp romance novel is historical fiction in some way. Yeah, there's something sexy about the past. I don't know what it is exactly that gets the blood that, pumping. I, I don't know. <laughs> the some sort of subjugation of women or yeah <laughs> that sexy the cost, sexy the so, costume slash role play act aspect to it maybe i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean yeah and certainly we like to romanticize the past in general you know the yeah. idea of like back when things were simpler and and you know people knew who they were and you yeah. know whatever and of course there's the the sort of really blatant taboos that are easy to capitalize on in historical fiction you know oh she's a noble woman and he's a stable boy you know that kind of thing yeah we Mm -hmm. must not they're just taboo is a lot easier to play with in history (laughs) which may have something to do with it they could really go go pretty crazy with that like um especially when it comes to race especially in like american historical fiction yes you know the, the you know there's there's a lot of really gross tropes associated with that as well like yeah uh, there's a lot of like uh jew slash nazi romance which is just not cool i have never even heard of that and i I, i'm not doubting that it exists (laughs) but that sounds downright like just isn't that deplorable like i mean usually i don't want to yuck anybody's yum but i'm gonna yuck that one that's not cool guys 
I guess we were talking about this before the the episode, but we were talking about uh, Inglorious Bastards. But that's kind of in that, right? With with Shoshana and that guy that's uh, uh, that. Yeah, kind of yeah, the with the 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 Nazi guy. And yeah, it's a sort of a subversion of it, which is cool because he's into her. He doesn't know she's a Jew, and she's like, "Yeah, I'm secretly a Jew, and you're a Nazi, and I hate you, but I have to pretend like I don't hate you." <laughs> Well, and and I think it also tries to like show Nazis in a little bit of a different light, but it but at the whole, the same time like the whole movie completely is just like <laughs> murdering Nazis. So yeah, I mean that's 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 <laughs> killing Nazis the movie. Exactly, uh, but I'll, at the same time trying to you know humanize especially that one. But he's yeah, also Frederick. Kind of- and then there's that, that really great scene. It's just a very good, complicated moment when they've got that Nazi captain as a captive and they're trying to t- ask him to you know tell them where the other units are and he refuses and so they're going to have Donnie Donowitz you know, do the bear Jew thing yeah. and Donnie looks at his medal and he says, you get that for killing Jews? And the Nazi looks at him very placidly and says, bravery. And it's like, oh... Mm-hmm. This is a difficult moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think there's probably a lot in that movie that if we really tried to examine it, we'd find a lot of really powerful moments, even though it's sort of a revenge fantasy comedy. Oh, way. yeah. I'm sure we'll do plenty in the future on uh, on sort of the complicated undercurrent in Tarantino movies. I have a lot to say about Tarantino. <laughs> but, yeah, that could and be I'll- a whole episode in and of itself i haven't seen hateful eight but is that supposed to be the the final of the trilogy of those sort of themed movies i guess so but I heard man it kind of is it different it's really really different like okay. that i think i think that let's leave hateful eight for now because that's a huge can <laughs> of worms i think you should see the movie and we should just talk about I, I it i definitely need to see it yeah because it's something to talk about okay. um but so one just to sort of get back to, to something a little lighter uh one of those tropes that shows up in a lot of historical fiction that just i'm starting to roll my eyes at every time is that plucky heroine who seems entirely divorced from her time and place and she says i don't want to wear a corset and i want to run around and be independent and i won't marry anybody if i don't want to and it's like okay like sometimes that character is really i mean she's usually pretty likable but how like it's a bit preposterous how many of them there are (laughs) oftentimes with red hair oh yeah well that that yeah the plucky (laughs) red-haired girl but you know even you've got like Elizabeth Swan in oh uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't even want to think about Elizabeth Swan. Yeah. <laughs> but she, you know, she. Although, um, although as 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 hated as the third Pirates movie is, she is such a badass in that movie. Yeah, it's just a question of whether or not she earned that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the wardrobe definitely did half the work for her, but. <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, but I mean, you know, in the first movie where she's like all you know irritated by the idea of this corset and it's like you live in late 18th century english colony like you, and you're a noble woman you, yeah she's the daughter of a governor like she'd be pretty familiar with the concept of a corset one would think i mean i guess i'm not super familiar with the underclothes uh in that period but i'm fairly familiar and i think that she wouldn't have been nearly as sort of caught off guard by it as she seemed to be right i mean it was obviously just for a joke for the audience but like she would she would have been wearing corsets since she was like probably three years old yeah i mean at least since like you know preteenhood yeah because that's just what that's just what you do it's how you're you that's that's how you look respectable and presentable like putting on i don't know it's 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 like not even thought about i would imagine yeah but but then so my 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 sort of big question cuz i'm you know i'm the kind of person who really likes to tease about historical inaccuracies anachronisms that kind of thing because i'm a history nerd and so when there's something that i just know is out of place it sticks out to me and you know it's funny or irritating or what have you but i mean the real question is like how much does it matter 
Because I think that there are those kinds of inaccuracies where it's like, ah, she probably would have been wearing corsets, but it's a funny joke and it's completely irrelevant to the plot. So, like, mm, who really cares? Yeah. Um, there are certainly other kinds of things where it, it can be a little bit more troubling. Um, you know, a lot of historical fiction, say, from that time period likes to sort of gloss over slavery and <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and then beyond that, you've sort of got the idea, like, the the misconceptions about race relations throughout history. Because in America, we're just super duper obsessed with that concept of, like, race subjugation and the, the sort of icky, complicated history we have with that. And, and we were super aware of it. So when it comes to, like, stuff taking place in the Middle Ages, people have the idea that that should hold... And it doesn't. Yeah. It's not accurate to that time. And when you do try to write something accurate for that period, people won't believe it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That also makes me think about how, I mean, in America, we talk a lot about race relations, especially in historical fiction. But I don't, I feel like we never hear about the history of um, subjugation of, the, of different races and colonization throughout Europe, which is like literally every major European country did the same thing. Well, and and that's sort of where it gets tricky because, yeah, most of the time our, you know, historical fiction and, you know, historical fantasy in Europe just is super duper white because people have yeah. the idea in their heads that it's like, yeah, well, it's medieval Europe. It was all white people. And that's not like, true. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even, even if, even if... It, it takes place before any sort of uh, mass gathering of slaves and, and taking them over to Europe. Like, black people still would have been there. Yeah, I mean, the Roman Empire, for sure, just spread a lot of different kinds of people all different places. People traveled, and, like... Yeah, and a lot of the Roman Empire was in Africa. Yeah, well, in, yeah, northern Africa, uh, you know, at the very least. Um, but that being said, you know, people do have this mistaken idea. Like, when they read something like Othello. They have the idea that it's like, oh, this is about how, because he's black, and so they're racist against black people. But historically, that's not s entirely accurate as a it's, way of looking a little, at it. Yeah, it's a little more complicated in that case, because it's, 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 it's more, more about a, xenophobia and, like, religious yeah. intolerance. Yeah, yeah, because he, he, in the text he's a Moor, which is uh, Muslim, right? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. he's Muslim and he is African, but yeah, it's it's I mean, certainly they didn't have, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. Like that wasn't a thing. It, there was no, you know, widespread slavery of African people in racism, Europe at the at time. At that point, the the word at least probably wasn't a thing. So oh, no, certainly it not. Just, it, they they found other creative ways of being assholes to black people sure and but the thing is it wasn't just it wasn't that he was black it was that he was yeah. not well in the case of uh the actual text not italian but really right. for shakespeare's it, audience it would be that he was not english yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's 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 different it, i mean and, and i don't think it's a semantic difference i think it really is a conceptual difference um, but, you know, people just have this really, really mistaken idea of, like, what people of color in Europe could be. And it's sort of a vicious cycle because movies aren't going to correct them because it's like, well, people just want to see what they want, what they are expecting. And then they come to expect those things that they see. So. <laughs> and it's also like this weird translation thing because Othello takes place before the time Shakespeare was writing in, correct? Oh yeah, honestly, Shakespeare wrote a lot of historical fiction. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's writing this history that doesn't reflect the his the the current state of his his world, and we're interpreting it through it being performed in his world. So it's like he's it's like th tw twice or three times removed from this like perspective on race and ethnicity and all that. So it's like it's been lost in translation how it might have been actually interpreted in whenever it was taking place in Italy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough to to know what to do about that kind of thing because, I mean, 
ultimately, like all of these anachronisms and the weirdness that we see in historical fiction is, it, you know, it comes from like, what's the term that people use for the, like historicity? Or, like the idea of like, it's not really historically accurate, but it is what people oh, yeah. imagine to it's, be. It's the, it's the, the, the generally accepted yeah, version. it's, you know, like, that's what it, that's what, it, like, like Braveheart, <laughs> William <laughs> Wallace, the real life William Wallace, absolutely would not have worn blue face paint, and absolutely <laughs> would not have worn a kilt, because, first of all, Scots didn't even wear that blue face paint, that was maybe the Picts, maybe, we're not even sure if they did that, but if they did, that would have been centuries earlier, and mm-hmm. then kilts weren't really a thing for several centuries after William Wallace lived. Like, none of that. <laughs> but people think, oh, yeah, like like medieval Scottish warriors, like face paint and kilts. Like, Mel Gibson very intentionally put those things in that movie because it's what people would want to see. Did he direct that? Yeah. Oh, I just yeah, don't pretty sure. him, so I don't pay attention. Yeah, I don't like him either. <laughs> but... I think that's a pretty, pretty uh, common... Uh, feeling (laughs) yeah and and you know and that like that is a case of people you know just wanting to see a thing and so they put it in and then you know there's the there's um, princess isabella is an adult woman in that movie when at the time historically she would have been two years old and living in france (laughs) but she does serve shakespeare again yeah with like Uh, romeo and juliet where she was 13 yeah, and but and that's yeah, that's that's I mean, in the text. She's thirteen versions, years old. Yeah. But all of like, our versions these days, it's like they're you know early twenties. Because yeah, we don't want to see that, and you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the mid- is, but I that mean, is the Middle Ages good. for you. But yeah, exactly. Uh, but what I was sort of getting at is, I feel like there are kinds of changes that you can make because like Isabella did serve a really good purpose in in Braveheart. Um, she makes sense to put there. So even though historically that's not really true, it still serves the story of the movie. Um, and so, you know, that's clearly an intentional choice for them to be like, mm, we got to put Isabella because she's a cool figure. And I think that she would fit in this story that we're making up as opposed yeah, anyone... to just sort of a, a, a neglectful anachronism. Yeah. Anybody writing or producing any sort of historical fiction has to weigh entertainment value and accuracy. Yes. Because the nitty gritty details might be just really boring. I mean, that's why <laughs> that's why history is not a more popular subject in high school and in college. Like, it, it, the nitty gritty can be really boring. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and it, it, it's also striking that balance of, like, finding the little details that make it feel authentic, that really immerse you, but not getting bogged down in them. Like, one thing I really like about, um, there's one little detail that, that, I appreciate about the Song of Ice and Fire book series, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, because it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't take place in the real world, but it's very much drawing upon, like, the 15th century, sort of late Middle Ages, and they don't have forks, because in the late Middle Ages, forks hadn't come to Europe yet. Everyone Mm -hmm. eats with their hands or with knives, uh, because forks came to Europe during the Renaissance uh, from the Middle East. And that's just a cool little detail that Martin decided to stick with to make it feel like... And, and that's that one I especially appreciate because a lot of people don't know that. They don't know when... I didn't know that. You just told me that for the first time, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, like, that that's one thing that I found to be really, really cool because it's just a great little authentic detail to make the world feel real. Well, I, I feel like that little detail has been so lost in other versions of history. Like yeah. we, we, we think of cutlery as like the, the sort of epitome of sophistication, especially <laughs> in like high society. It's interesting. Yeah. It, it forks, the origins are in a place that are often is often labeled as like the opposite of that. Yeah. Sort of background, which is super funny because yeah, in the middle ages, the Middle East was, like, technologically much further advanced than Europe. Like, they were having a real golden age uh, well, during that time. Longer. Way longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were, they were coming up with some really good stuff around that time. 
you know, during the, the Dark Ages, which is a terrible name because in places that weren't Europe, things were pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, they were, people in Europe were like sort of, I don't know, I, I'm trying to think of an idiom that explains what I'm trying to say. Up a creek without a paddle? I don't know. Well, yeah, um, the, the, the Roman Empire I mean, left and they were high and dry. Well, and it's like awful conditions, super wet with their, when there's no like medicine, sort of like, you know, no modern medicine. So it's, yeah. you're going to die. Like, most likely yeah. you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, though, like, people do have also another misconception is about how, like, how bad it actually was in Europe during the Middle Ages. Like, things mm-hmm. were actually a lot more okay than people imagine. It's just that that period of time got a really bad reputation because uh, certain historians thought that, you know, the the Roman Empire was super great, you know, the classical period was super great, and then the Renaissance was super great, and then the Middle Ages were the, the Dark Ages, and there's just that bad time in between where things were terrible, but they <laughs> they really weren't so bad as people like to think. But, you know, we want to see that in our movies, that's what we think, and so, uh, you know, we go to the movies to see something like that Robin Hood movie that everyone forgot about that came out... <laughs> A few years ago, um, and it's got a, everything's brown and dirty and terrible because that's what the Middle Ages were like, weren't they? <laughs> well, also, like, that brings up another point in terms of historical fiction. It it really matters who wrote it. Yeah, You know, like, it, it's all about the perspective because, and, it, and that ties into sort of like the, um, when we were talking about the romance, sort of the, uh, <laughs> you know, like... It, if if a uh, it just really matters. Like, well, yeah, I mean it's it, you know there are a lot written by the victors that sort of thing. Well, and 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 more than that, you know there are a lot of genres of historical fiction. Like that's not really a genre; it's more of a setting, if anything. And so you know, is this a this is a historical romance? Is this um, you know a war drama? Is this you know there's there's a lot of different versions of historical fiction, and so we get different things. You know the. <laughs> I have a feeling that a lot of, you know, historical romances, especially some of the pulpier ones, gloss over the reality of, like, underwear during their time (laughs) periods. Because guess what? It's not sexy. Women didn't wear underwear pretty much ever until, like, mm, the early 1900s. (laughs) Like, women didn't wear underwear. also, Also, no elastic, even when underwear... Was there. Yeah, you got you got a drawstring, <laughs> buddy. Uh, yeah, there's this great book. I, I've been meaning to pick it up. I've read a little bit of it. Um, it's it's uh, it's a book about sort of anachronism in historical writing and like the kinds of pitfalls that happen and the sort of common errors that are made. It's called Medieval Underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's the title actually. Yeah, it's a really fun book. It's a fun read, and I, I've been meaning to pick it up to read the rest of it. Um, but yeah, like, but if you think about it, you know, for most of history, underwear would have just been a really, really big nuisance for women to wear. Like, there was no good reason for them to wear it. Uh, in yeah. fact, you know, with privacy issues, like, private restrooms weren't a thing. Like, so, <laughs> so to get a little blue here, like, you just find some spot out of the way and squat down and pull up your dress well, a little. Yeah, nobody, like, if you had to pull uh, yeah, down some underwear... Your dress is going to be covering most of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, like, you're not... It's nothing's going to be... Tr- yeah, in fact, to, like, hike it up to, like, deal with underwear, you'd be sh- flashing people a lot more than if you just, like, kind of <laughs> settle down someplace and do your business. Like, it, yep. underwear would have just been a problem for women I- throughout most of history. Like, they wouldn't have served any good purpose. Uh, they weren't necessary, and they would just get in the way. So, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine, like... Like we, all of those big petticoats and stuff, and having to hike it all up, and like that would just be terrible. <laughs> well, now I'm just imagining, like, I mean, even if you talk about, even as we advance further in, into history, like we've got corsets, which are just not fun. <laughs> we've got, you know, really just crazy bras that are like not fun. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I feel like it's. I mean, not to like go a little too far off topic, but like women underwear has been a subjugator of women. <laughs> sure, I mean, in in various periods and for various reasons, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, but <laughs> it's so funny. Just a funny little anecdote. Um, it was uh, Catherine de Medici uh, of the, the Medici family. She had invented basically a, some underwear to wear while riding a horse because that's one activity where uh, it, it would be kind of nice. You need something. Um, and so she was like, hey, hey, I made this thing so I can ride a horse better. And people were scandalized. And, you know, women were like, oh, you know, uh, underneath a woman's skirt, uh, you know, her, her bottom should be bare as God intended. Like, it was like a, <laughs> it was like not okay that she had made these underwear. They're like, that's just absurd and scandalous that you would want to wear something under your dress. That's the whole history of the Miss Medici family is that exact same thing. Absurd and scandalous. <laughs> it's a very fascinating <laughs> subject. Um, the, what, I, what I did recall, though, probably one of my favorite films uh, that's historical fiction that I probably should have read the book by now, but I haven't, is Atonement. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw the movie and did not read the book. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that movie. I should and give it another watch. I, it was a lot. I watched it like back when it first came out, and I was a little young okay. for it. Yeah, um, yeah. You might. I would recommend watching it again because I I didn't watch it till till college, and there's a lot going on. It's yeah, really well, because I just remember being irritated that at the end it's like actually psych, nothing, none of that was real. <laughs> I can I can I can see how, as a as a kid, that would be really sort of frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, I think there was a lot more at work that I just didn't pick up on yet. So I should give that one another go. And hey, I'm... I mean, it, it, it might still like if you sort of see through it, it might still sort of not work for you. But I, I appreciated it as a 20 year old. Well, I'm a big fan of James McAvoy. So either way, I, I want to check it out. <laughs> he He's good in that movie. And um, I remember Benedict the... Cumberbatch being really, really creepy. My best friend hated him for so long because of his role in that movie. It's really creepy. It's awful. It's truly he's awful. The worst guy ever. <laughs> Which is so funny that he's become like this phenomenon and like sex symbol after this yeah. movie. Oh, speaking of another historical, actually, it wasn't really fiction. It was more. Well, I mean, it's always fiction if it's a movie, but um, yeah, uh, the Imitation Game. Ooh, ugh, I have so many problems with that movie. You do? Oh no. Go ahead. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, and these are just like... Oh, well, one... Movie problems. What's her name? Did a terrible job, I thought. What, Keira Knightley? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't... Think, I, I, don't, I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it was uh, not her best. I, I, I have mixed feelings about her as a performer. But, no, I mean, the thing about, the thing about that movie, uh, aside from any historical stuff, is that it's just... It doesn't actually know what what it, it's trying to say like i don't know what point that movie was oh, trying to make yeah. and it, it doesn't it didn't either know where it was coming from yeah it didn't it have a point they just threw in the like chemical castration stuff like, there at the end and then they're like maybe they're trying to make a point about like different kinds of minds are still people you know sort of the parallel between him and the computer and I, it just it was all confused and it had all these different things that they wanted to get to but like was it a movie about him being like probably autistic and uh you know like working on the enigma thing or was it about him being homosexual and being persecuted later in life like those two stories were very very different stories and it just had to get to both of them because those are the important things about alan turing (laughs) and it it, it lost it and honestly you could probably devote so much time to every single part of his life whereas that Mm -hmm. movie tried to span his life yeah, and, and least, it's just got too least, many discrete yeah. parts. I mean, that's, you know, when you're doing a, a biopic, like, you kind of have to, you know, fake a story because lives don't work that way. Um, and yeah. it just didn't do that very well because it, they wanted to talk about these two pretty discrete things and they didn't know how to marry them and it didn't end up knowing what point it was trying to make at all. Yeah. And I think we can probably all agree that he did a pretty good job with the character. Oh yeah. Um, I have no problem with but Cumberbatch's I do agree that it didn't really know what the message it was trying to give. Cause I mean, if you, if you would talk to anybody after they saw that movie and you asked them what the movie was about, they would have been like, Oh, it's about like a, a this guy who made this computer. And know? then also he was gay. <laughs> yeah. Right. I love the question. <laughs> gay? Like, was he, was he, but, but then also Keira Knightley was like, 
His wife? Friends with him? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly can't fault Benedict Cumberbatch for that, but I do fault the screenwriter. <laughs> <laughs> I do fault the screenwriter. Uh, so, but yeah, so that, and that's, you know, that's another issue with historical fiction because, you know, biopic is a, is a big part of historical fiction. And it's the question of, like, how do I take this historical event and make it seem like a story? Because things don't really yeah. happen that way. And or that's how why... Turn, how do we turn a person's life into a two-hour event? Yeah, and that's why, you know, I, I don't really have any qualms with them, you know, in Braveheart taking Princess Isabella and sticking her where she didn't exist because well, yeah, she fit. It. it made a good story. Yeah, it wasn't just about her. It wasn't her life story. Yeah, it was like, you know, oh, this is a good device in order for William Wallace to ultimately get his victory. And that's fine. Like, <laughs> that works for me, especially when it's, you know, such a very, very, very old story. I don't feel like we necessarily... Though, <laughs> I will say another another funny fact that I learned about um, Braveheart from... Uh, I, I was visiting the Tower of London and uh, mm-hmm. going on one of those tours with one of the yeoman warders, and he was... <laughs> Quetching about all the Scotsmen who come and they say, "Oh, where is this the door they brought in William Wallace? Is this where they did it?" And he's like, "That didn't happen. William Wallace <laughs> visited the Tower of London once. He walked in and he walked out. He he was not executed here. None of that happened." <laughs> so straight from the straight from the Yeoman Warders, that didn't happen. Speaking of uh, the Tower of London, how familiar are you with Philippa Gregory? I don't think at all. She's the sort of the queen of, like, sort of uh, historical royal romance. She wrote, you know, The Other Boleyn Girl. She wrote The White Queen. She wrote she wrote all of those ones that everyone adapts into movies. Um, just sort of the romances of the kings and queens of England. Um, I bring it up because, um, like... The, uh, the TV series based on her novel, The White Princess, uh, mm-hmm. is just coming to an end. And I have, I've read, I read half of the book and I could not bring myself to read the rest because I hated it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, I mean, she, yeah, Philippa Gregory is like, you know, she's the, the, the word on, um, you know, medieval royal romances and, uh, ugh, that book Ugh. But it seems like the show has deviated from a lot of what I hated about the book, which is interesting. Like, I should probably watch it and see what I think. Um, because it's really, I mean, it, so it tells the story of um, Elizabeth of York, who uh, was the wife of Henry Tudor um, after the War of the Roses. She, um, you know, she was from the York family and she married him to sort of end the conflict between the Yorks and the Tudors, um, bringing an end to the War of the Roses. And in Philippa Gregory's version of the story, she was the lover of Richard III before he died and then Mm -hmm. was made to marry Henry, who basically is the murderer of her lover. But the the thing about this book is that it's, you know, it's one of those sort of unwilling... You know, it's like, uh, I, you know, I don't like you and you don't like me, but we got to get married. But he's, like, super, super abusive to her. Yeah. Like, he he rapes her. He's verbally and physically abusive to her. Um, and it's sort of like the story of this woman just sort of bearing all of this. Um, yeah. But then at a certain point in the book, it's just like, actually, now they love each other. Like, why? Oh. Nobody knows. Like, it's really creepy and weird, and he's never made to apologize for anything that he did to her. Like, she just is in love with him now. And he's like, oh boy, now you're in love with me. Oh. Hooray. And he's still kind of abusive. Uh, and I just couldn't take it. I just couldn't take it. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the story is her just sort of, like, dealing with the abuses of her husband and her mother-in-law. And at a certain point in the book, she's being made to choose her motto as queen, because queens had mottos. And the mother-in-law suggests humble and penitent. And, oh. yeah, I know. And Elizabeth's like, oh, you bitch. Like, I know what you're doing here. Like, this is, sucks and is super cruel to me. But, like, fine. I'll do it your way. Humble and penitent it is. 
But then it, the, I saw like a preview for the show, and it was that scene. <laughs> but like when she's like humble and penitent, she's like, "No way, not humble and penitent. I won't be. I'll be." And I can't remember what she said, but it was some like rebellious alternative yeah, to awful. that. And it's like, yeah. what? Like that's really different. So I think maybe they sort of took the stuff that I hated about the book and they fixed it. So I should <laughs> check it out. God, so you, I couldn't like you, you bringing up flip. <sighs> philippa gregory and me googling her yeah finally clicked me into what i forgot or the show i couldn't think of oh hey the tutors oh i thought i mentioned it earlier yeah we didn't i guess not but anyway the tutors starring jonathan reese myers is what i was yeah. thinking of i never never really watched it but it was like a phenomenon if i remember right it kicked off the whole sexy history thing that <laughs> that's so yeah. popular now yeah, is yeah. I watched. I didn't watch all of it. Young and sexy. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I didn't watch all of that series, but I definitely watched some of it. It was pretty. Honestly, the only reason I stopped was because Netflix. It was all screwy and like the episodes were out of order, and I just couldn't oh, be bothered God, to like I deal with that. it. So I stopped watching. <laughs> you uh, when we were first sort of coming up with this topic, you had uh, you'd mentioned you kind of wanted to talk about the Will Smith movie Wild Wild West. <laughs> Yes, and only because I absolutely love it. I shouldn't <laughs> love it. There's no reason I should love it. It is unredeemable, but I love it. Yeah, there's a <laughs> lot going on in that movie. Definitely. Uh, well, and it's you know it's based on the television series from the '60s, Wild Wild West. They made some real big changes though from the show. <laughs> well, I mean. If you're going to bring in Will Smith for anything, you have to just go all out, you know? You do. He's not He's not going to half-ass anything. Yeah, and as <laughs> just as deplorable as it is, Kenneth Branagh just chewing up the scenery as Lovelace is just too much for me to bear. Like, he's so he's, he's, hilarious. He's, he's, he's so awful and so great and, ugh. Like, I mean, and, okay... Kenneth Branagh and Kevin Klein are two of my favorite actors. When they're together, I love it. But this movie. <laughs> but then they throw in Will Smith, who yeah. is unlike either of them, at just like such, just completely different in every possible way. Yeah. Well, okay. And here's the interesting thing about that as far as like historicity goes. Um, because. Okay, so they decided to take the character of Jim West and make him a black guy because Will Smith was the biggest thing ever at the time. And they were like, this could be yeah. fun. This could be interesting. But they have a really weird relationship with his blackness in that movie. Like, they don't go mm -hmm, full yeah. Django with it. But there are some weird sort of references to his race. And, and it's just like, it's not really comfortable dealing with, like... Like it doesn't even really know where where it wants to land. They almost they 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 really I want to say they really pretend because it's post Civil War that, that everything's just chill. Yeah, that that it's like that it's like up to date like to, with us yeah. now. Yeah, like they, all they that's say over they now. Pretend that. Yeah, like <sighs> and and it, and it and I get it because it's sort of like that '90s movie like. The 90s were all about, like, okay, we're cool with people of color now. But we yeah, were not. Yeah, we're and diverse. We are still not. <laughs> right? So. Multiculturalism. So it was very much the, that, like, just pretend it didn't happen and then it didn't happen. That sort of thing. Mm hmm So they definitely, yeah, they definitely have a really weird perspective on race in that movie. Um, and, like, you know, it's got a lot of fun stuff. You know, all the steampunk stuff is pretty cool. Like, There's some really great visuals, too. And some of the gadgets are really neat, too. And that sort of brings in the whole, like, James Bond feel, too, with the gadgets. Yeah, which was an aspect of the original TV series. Um, so they definitely had fun playing with that, but I think they just sort of lost what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And all of that. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of movies that are really similar in tone and in visuals, but I can't think of them. I don't know why. Well, I would put it, I would group it in even with the sort of, um, sort of Guy Ritchie like Sherlock you're, Holmes. You're so right. You're so right. And I think it's the the sort of steampunk and the humor. Sort of whimsical history, like yeah. action. Well, especially the end of the first the end of the first Sherlock is total fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh it's that sort of 
yeah, swashbuckling history almost. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and with like a little bit of magic in for flavor. Just Although, yeah, and then you know sometimes it's not real magic, but yeah, but it, yeah, it's always got that sort of whimsical, magical, swashbuckling feel to it. And again, with the pirates movies, it's uh, well, this is, speaking of you mentioned it earlier, but the new King Arthur movie that's. Guy That's Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, yes. I mean, I remember yeah. seeing Pulsar? that trailer and being like, hi, Guy Ritchie. Got right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think that's deeper. probably the... Well, there's probably a lot of reasons I want to see it, but he's a, a factor, I would say, for sure. Yeah. So <laughs> it is tanking. It's going to lose like $150 million. It's It's literally the same color scheme as that Robin Hood movie you were talking about. Yeah, it does look like it's more fun than Robin Hood, though. Robin okay. Hood was just if, boring. If I'm honest, it's probably Snow White and the Huntsman, but with men. Yeah, I mean, it just looks like Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes, but with King Arthur. Magic. I got another great example of historical fiction that absolutely should not exist, and that is... Yes, yeah, tell me. Um, what is it? Is it Zemeckis? Yeah, Zemeckis uh, Beowulf, the animated one. Oh my goodness, that is such a weird movie. I actually didn't enjoy it. Okay, I have I have so many feelings on this movie because I don't I don't know who it was for because okay, <laughs> it's 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 animated. Yeah. But it's not for kids. It's not a family no. movie at all because it's really really violent and action packed. But the like action movie like 300 type bros are going to be put off by the fact that it's an animated film so they're not going to go see it either um and then like the history nerds aren't really gonna like they're they're the most likely to like it but they didn't um there is some really interesting stuff in there to look at as far as how it relates to the original poem but Mm -hmm. they're not going to go and see it because it's one of those weird action like who did he think he was making this movie for? I think they tried so hard to make Beowulf uh, into, like, popular culture that... And I really don't think it's possible. Yeah, well, because there's know? some really interesting like, how do you stuff this going medieval on. Poem, or it's more than medieval, it's even eight more ancient than that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's still the Middle Ages, but yeah, the very early Middle Ages. And, and yeah... I, any sort of movie... I mean, clearly, they were kind of trying to do what ultimately ended up happening with um, 300. Yeah. You know, that sort of, like, kick-ass history. But then there is some really interesting, like, historical stuff going on. You know, they've, they've got um, Grendel speaking in Old English. Like, that was crazy. Like, I kind of loved that portrayal of Grendel. It was upsetting and cool. Like, that was really, really neat. And then it's sort of playing with the ideas because one thing about early medieval writing early medieval epic poetry is like sort of the assumption that you have to have is that all characters are always telling the truth like characters do not lie Mm -hmm. in beowulf so when you know beowulf is defending his sort of past and saying like oh well yeah that happened but it was only because you know i did lose that swimming race but only because i had to fight a bunch of monsters like that's the truth it is (laughs) it is absolutely the truth (laughs) whereas this this version of beowulf it's sort of a question of like what if it was a lie? And I think that yeah. that is a really interesting and complicated issue to deal with because of that particular facet of the story. But people don't, like, people who would go see that movie don't know or care about that. <laughs> I also think um, a lot of people had problems with Angelina Jolie in that movie, but mm-hmm. I kind of liked it because I thought the, the, the sort of visuals they chose for her were really cool. Yeah, and I think people were mostly, I mean, you know, people who would care are like, ah, oh, she's supposed to be a big scary monster. Why is she a sexy lady? And it's like, well, <laughs> it's because of the other thing that they're doing. Like, I, I don't think that it was a, um, like, a dumb Hollywood choice. Like, I think, I mean, it, to a degree, of course it is, because they just want to have a sexy lady in the movie. But I think that it is doing interesting work as far as the themes of the movie, uh, but ultimately, like, the people who are going to see it don't know or care about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I think it came out a little too early for what would have worked um, visually, because it is definitely uncal- Uncanny Valley territory. Oh, um, yeah. Well, all of his, because that that was the same with uh, Polar Express and um, Christmas Carol, his other. I think, I think those work a little bit better because they're, like, fun and cute. 
Yeah, but they still but. look wrong. Like, Polar Express, they don't look right. Uh... But, yeah, I'm just fascinated by that. Ba- I, I didn't see it for the longest time because I was just like, that sounds dumb. But it's fascinating. Like, yeah. I don't know what his thinking behind making that was. Like, who did he think that movie was for? Because I don't I know. Mean, yeah. I mean, <sighs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> to sort of wrap up a little, um, I guess, what are your feelings on sort of anachronism in historical fiction and what kind of obligations people have to accuracy versus storytelling? I think it has to do with intent. Like, I think anachronisms can be really powerful because it's it's almost like a visual immediate rep, or a metaphor, like in poetry. You know, it's, it's, it's juxtaposing completely different things sometimes, and I think it can be, be really striking. And, and I think that's where Wild Wild West succeeds is like it mm-hmm. the steampunk Western. Um, and, and that's visually interesting. Yeah. But, uh-huh. but more than sort of blatant, like anachronisms that audiences are going to notice, um, the kinds of anachronisms that, that I, I'm talking about are more the sort of subtle, you know, maybe in service of just streamlining, you know, the, this is what people are going to expect to see people. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 the heroine who, doesn't want to do what her dad says and you know that that kind of thing where it's like mm, i don't know about the the historical veracity of what you're feeding me here you know it, like people were um bothered you you brought up outlander um there's a scene in which her husband beats her and historically yeah. that would have been a perfectly normal and acceptable thing thing for a loving husband to do but to a modern audience that's really icky and so a lot of things will leave that kind of thing out i think it it's still about like the intent of the creator like if if you're trying to like show us an accurate representation that's one thing but you have to know what kind of impact that's going to have on a modern audience you need Mm -hmm. to understand that showing somebody being raped could show them oh it was hard for them then but it could also be like this is okay and it's not Mm -hmm. well yeah and that's so that's you need to spin and explain almost in and it, and I know that filmmakers can do it but they need to sort of give it a point it needs to have a point so yeah cuz i'm still trying to sort of struggle with that the idea of like what what is sort of reasonable to to change i mean it makes me think of um uh, speaking of plucky redheads disobeying <laughs> their fathers brave yeah it's Who, and they were they were kilts in that and they shouldn't <laughs> i mean brave is like uh, wonderfully well loved by most people and i think they knew what they were trying to accomplish they wanted a movie for mothers and daughters and mm-hmm. i guess fathers well, could it, certainly enjoy it too yeah parents and children but like that that's what that movie is about they're acknowledging like th- you are breaking with tradition right now young lady as opposed to just sort of like characters like um the you know the hero in in um in the mummy or what have you where you know it's just sort of like thrown in there just to make her likable um you know rose from titanic she's very headstrong <laughs> and it's just I like absolutely love <laughs> and i'm not I saying that there's necessarily series. anything <laughs> I, they're very fun movies and I'm not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with it but certainly they are creating an anachronistic character strictly for the yeah. purposes of making her likable yeah and and I think again they I really wish they would think harder about that because they could probably accomplish a lot more if, if they had an idea of what they want an audience to feel if they actually crafted a character to accomplish that rather than just using a trope. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of shorthand for sure that goes on with those characters. That I mean, and it, I it, it happens, always comes back to the corset, doesn't it? it ha- yes, and it happens a lot in YA fiction, I think, too. Like any young adult fantasy books that I read, the main character is usually a plucky girl who's feeling out of place, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's definitely easy because we all feel out of place and they sort of use that character in ways as an everyman but Mm -hmm. also 
to sort of, sort of be like, oh, but she's not like everybody else. So it's, it's really weird. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of complicated feelings about sort of uh, a, a duty to accuracy versus sort of tell, wanting to tell a certain kind of a story. Ultimately, yeah. I don't know. I mean, certainly taking liberties is 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 fair and necessary, but I it's a question mark. To, you just have to own up to it, like let or at people least know, make hey, those choices isn't... intentionally. Yeah, exactly. Know you what you're know changing. What you're do- exactly. Know what you're doing. <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna do like a Sherlock movie or Sherlock Holmes, you gotta know the history. You gotta you know you gotta you have to know the source text. So yeah. if the source text is is history, you need to know what the fuck you're talking about. And yeah, then can... yeah. Make make those conscious choices. Like Mel Gibson with the kilts and the face paint. I'm sure he knew. I'm sure his costumer was like, um, Mel, that's really not right. And he says, I don't care. This is this is going to convey what I'm trying to convey. Yeah, and it ultimately is a very striking visual image. Sure. And people it works. exactly it helps with the setting for sure. Um, mm-hmm. At least in people's in people's minds, the physical setting, not necessarily the temporal setting. Yeah, I guess that's that's <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I guess just know what you're changing and 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 do it on purpose. Yeah, and I think that it that sort of advice or that sort of a thought is is really good for any sort of literature. Like, if you're gonna start writing about a black character, you better know what their life could be like. Some people would say that you can't write black characters unless you're black. I don't know if I would agree with that, but you you need to like do research. Yeah. And under, and and sort of you know it's it, there's you have to know what you at least have an idea of what you're talking about. <laughs> Good like, advice. Some when you're writing, of an idea. have an idea of what you're talking. <laughs> don't just like unless you want to make the next wild wild west you better know what you're talking about (laughs) yeah clearly somebody didn't (laughs) but again love that movie (laughs) sure it's a good time it's it's a wild wild time (laughs) oh god (laughs) okay let's go let's finish (laughs) i'm gonna get watch we're gonna get our first hate comment about my love for that movie (laughs) well hey it's a comment (laughs) there we go yeah exactly all press is good press. Yeah, anything, <laughs> please. That being said, leave us a comment. Please, tell us what you think of this episode. Tell us how dumb we are. Whatever ask you want to say. Ask us a question about us, about what we talk about. Give us a suggestion of what, what you might want to hear us talk about next time. Yes, please help us think of topics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're just going to end up talking about Riverdale every episode. Yeah, Riverdale and Hannibal. (laughs) That does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us. And you can like the video if you kind of just like us. Also, you can follow us on our new Twitter page uh, at LitMeritPod. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember... No No guilty guilty pleasures. pleasures.